All right. Here we are today, um, Ditch Digger CEO Q. Uh, we're going to have some fun today, man. Man, I'm so excited about this guy right here. Here's the guy we both know well and uh, my, one of my best buddies. You know, the funny thing is I, I've said this a few times. Ed, I, so we're with Ed, Ed Zeman. Ed, Ed, say hi. Hello. So Ed, Ed Zeman, uh, you know, I've said this you know, a bunch of times with the first, first of the first people I've, I've done this with, right? Um, and, and anybody's going to look at this or listen to this and say, come on, that's a bunch of BS, right? Brian, there's no way you're good friends with all these people, these, these cool people. And, and I'm blessed that I've, I've, I've been a part of organizations, as you know, Q, that, that put me in front of, you know, great people and I get to be friends with so many of them. Um, but, uh, the, the, in these first podcasts, they are going to be geared to a lot of my good friends from YPO, um, from Turning Point USA, Job Careers Network, and some of the organizations that I participate in, right? Um, but but this guy here, Ed, Ed is uh, definitely one of my best friends and a, and a favorite of mine, and I know he is of yours as well. Right? Yeah, you? man, he's a, a true servant leader. I, I remember vividly the first time that I met Ed. It was actually at a YPO Expo, and um, he was like, true mentors, this is this thing that Gary's doing. I was like, yeah, absolutely. He's like, you know what, I'm, I'm in a phase of my life where I want to give back, and he gave me his card. Uh -huh. And I've, I've heard that before, and literally we've had an amazing conversations, and he's an extremely true advocate of true mentors. He's helped implement one of the things that have uh, expeditiously grew our uh, mentorship platform, and um, he just have a, a quality mind and a great servant lead. So I'm excited for today, man. Very often I, I look and say, "Dang, Ed's doing you know this organization that that you and I started, right? Ed's doing more than I am for it. I got to get my butt in gear, right? Yeah, amen. No, Cause, cause I don't. <laughs> Ed is constantly helping out anywhere he can, and, and he's I love a, it. and he's an awesome uh, mentor to everybody that he touches. So, uh, so Ed, uh, we're gonna we're gonna get started, and I, you know, I, we we're gonna we're gonna have a lots of Ed love here for sure, and uh, hope you're not too embarrassed because you're not the type of guy that it looks for this, I know, but uh, we're going to talk about it. You're going to talk about your story, and we're going to dig a lot of stuff out of here. So okay, sounds so, great. So let, let's let's just start with uh, you know your 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 story. We like to start with hey, where'd you you know your your your, your youth? Where'd you grow up? What was it like growing up? Uh, you know, you can tell us about the you know what what a scholar you were because I I know that story <laughs> and stuff. Uh, you know, and, and all the accolades you got as a kid and you know, like. Roll, baby. Uh, well, I guess I'll start. I was uh, born in Chicago. I grew up in Park Ridge, uh, about three blocks in the city of Chicago. Uh, my father uh, grew up in Chicago and so did my mother. And uh, my father started working right out of college as a door-to-door -door salesperson selling staplers. And uh, did pretty well with that and then started selling nails door-to-door -door and always had uh, part-time jobs working nonstop. Um, and then one day, because he knew a lot of people in Edison Park and Park Ridge, he decided to open up a little real estate shack, hmm. literally with two saw horses and a door for a desk <laughs> in, the, in the neighborhood of Edison Park. And uh, that went pretty well. He was listing and selling houses, and my mother was the bookkeeper, so she was the partner, and uh, my mother would give him an allowance of 50 bucks a month. <laughs> at, if, if every th bill was paid, that's what he got to go out and have some beers and do some poker with his friends. Uh, so I started off working very, very young on my father's side projects. So at five or six years old, I was sweeping floors and loading dumpsters. He was doing additions and that kind of stuff. Um, I also, when I was probably 15, I don't know how I did this, but I worked at a hot dog stand making hot dogs and mm -hmm. uh, and doing that whole thing. Um, what was the hot dog stand called? Do you remember It was the called name? Dog and Subs. Dog so it was actually subs. hot dogs and submarine sandwiches All over right. there in Edison Park. Uh, no longer there, but uh, it was fun. Uh, then I worked, boy, a whole bunch of different jobs. I worked at a garden center in high school um, selling uh, bushes and sod and that kind of stuff over there in Park Ridge. I actually worked at the O'Hare Airport um, at, for a machine shop that fixed the jetways. I uh, what else did I do? I uh, worked uh, high rises downtown. I was uh, the only non-union guy on the entire shop, and it wow. was interesting because they used to tell me constantly to slow down. Oh, yeah. My father would tell me always to hurry up and work faster. <laughs> These union guys were always telling me to slow down. I was making them look bad, and I was in in college. And the funny part about that story was is. Whenever there was a side job and guys were doing roofs, the union guys, I was the first laborer they'd pick because I was the hardest working one. And mm -hmm. they knew they would have a hard working guy on the crew as opposed to another oh, union guy. Exactly. So that was my, my stories with unions. And I said, well, I'm not going to slow down. And so they would get mad at me on the job, but they loved me on the weekends on side jobs. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How's that work, right? The same guys that didn't like your speed at, you know, during the week loved you when they were working, you were working directly for them on the weekends. 
And then I got into pouring concrete when my father had some mobile home parks. I poured concrete at the mobile home park, laid sod, dug water lines, and uh, did a whole bunch of stuff. Wait, 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 wait a minute. You didn't tell us about this. You didn't tell us you this, this experience in concrete work because we'd have you paving out with us when we're paving your, when we're paving your roads out on those sites. We'd have you out there working, wouldn't we, Hugh? <laughs> Absolutely. He's, he's kept that quiet. Son man, of a gun. Man. Yeah, so yeah, I we, laid a lot of concrete. <laughs> st- stuck a lot of concrete, a lot of square feet in we're, my day. We're yep. going to get you back engaged in concrete. Now that you're, you're trying to find things to do with your time and all that, this is going to be a new thing for you. <laughs> I could use the workout. Yeah. So yeah. I grew up pretty middle class. I mean, I uh, my my mom. We didn't have a lot of money. I guess I didn't know any better. Um, mm-hmm. I had hand me downs my whole life. Hand me down clothes. A box would come from my cousins up in Wisconsin, and I had a lot of Wisconsin T-shirts and <laughs> blue jeans that were old from the cousins and. I don't think I had my first clothes until I was probably about 10 years old or so. Um, so that was pretty cool. And, and then I, I just remember growing up, my mom would make a buck last a long way. And I don't know if you remember those generic drinks that they used to have at the Jewel, the, the white label and the green oh, yeah, and black. Yeah, yeah. We had a lot of generic stuff. And uh-huh. again, I didn't know any better. And yeah. uh, I got food on the table. And middle class back in those days was everybody was middle class. So mm-hmm. it was fine. So Now, about, uh, you know, you, I know you went to college, but tell us about high school. I mean, uh, what was your experience there? You were academic all star. Tell me about that, because you know, smarter guys you are today. Anybody meet you would expect, and I'm telling you, and this is truthful. Anybody expect they meet Ed to say they'd say, "This smart dude, right?" I mean, he, this guy. You know, what, what, what uh, where did he get his undergrad? Where did he get, where did he do his MBA? I, I believe anybody that meets Ed would think that. Tell us about your upgrade. Well, I school. was never much of a student. I was a, a C minus student my entire life, and really, really struggled with reading at a book and taking a test, and frankly, paying attention because I didn't think the teachers were teaching these things that were worthwhile. Mm-hmm. So I kind of would drift off and just not pay attention, and I just wasn't into it. And in high school, um, I was in special ed. Back in those days, they called the dummy center, so all the kids would. Uh, Say, Zina, are you going to the dummy center again? <laughs> oh, no. And, uh, you know, I, back in those days, you just sort of laughed. And, uh, boy, oh, boy. I was in the room at the end of the hall with the carpeting, and, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of characters in there. Mm-hmm. So they used to teach, tease us all, being that we were going to learn how to make French fries at that, at that dummy center. And oh, wow. uh, so I wasn't very good at uh, academic, and I, I made it out of high school, and I went to a state college, so mm-hmm. barely made it out of there as well. How'd you get in the state school, uh, college? Barely. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I was, again, not a very good student, and I, I didn't have much respect for the teachers and teaching real life, real world things. So I just wasn't into it and, uh, you know, did my best, but I think I had some other learning disabilities with reading and comprehension and those things. So mm-hmm. I actually wanted to follow my father's footsteps, so I tried to get in the business school, and uh, I got rejected. So Eastern Illinois would not allow me to uh, be a member of the business school. Mm-hmm. Somebody asked me years later if I was going to build a, a wing on the school at Eastern Illinois in the business school, and I said, well, they wouldn't let me in, so I guess <laughs> I, I can't do that. So It's an easy, uh, de- easy decision here. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I didn't save that letter, but I wish I would have. So. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. Uh, is that so? Would you say a lot of this early, um, I guess, opportunities and challenges is kind of one of the reasons why you, um, I guess, is that kind of why you have a chip on your shoulder as far as making sure that you do better than most, or um, you know, get to that next phase of of, of growth and, and success? Yeah, I was lucky to have a, a mother and father that would tell me, "Hey, you know, you may not be the smartest kid book wise, but work hard." And just mm-hmm. work hard. And I was beat into my head to continue to work hard. You've got to work harder than everybody else because you're not as smart as. Now, they didn't come out quite and say it that <laughs> way, but uh, that was what I took from it. And I figured that hard work, a lot of people aren't willing, as Gary knows, a lot of people aren't willing to roll up their sleeves and work, you know, 10, 12, 14 hour days and really do what it takes to make be successful. And it sounds simple and it sounds, you know, cliche but the hard work and really going at it nonstop and having that is 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 a key to success for mm-hmm. me anyway and i think a lot of people will say that yeah we we you know we talk about all the time right Any, anybody that's uh that's had great success you know somehow had some grit and and work ethic that not everybody had, you know everybody around them had um and and, and you definitely have, you, you've shown that all the years i've known you um, tell me, you tell us, so Zeman Homes, your your dad's uh, your dad started Zeman Homes. Uh, know a little bit about that story, and and you've you've taken this thing from you know th- been thrown on your lap, and you've taken it from where it was at to this to a to a large organization that uh, 
uh, that's all over the country, not many parts of the country. We're, we're fortunate enough to be able to do some work for you. So we've seen a lot of your parks. We pave a lot of your roads and all that and, and uh, have fun doing that. But tell me about, uh, you know, the start of Zeman Homes and, and how, you, how you got your start in, in, the, in the business. Yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned, my father had a, a local real estate office. And uh, by coincidence, uh, there was the uh, Mobile Home Institute Regional Headquarters of Chicago that happened to also be in Edison Park. Huh. So my father actually met a uh, young man who was the executive director in the local uh, restaurant there and pub, and uh, he, they got to talking, and the guy, Larry, said, hey, bud, my father, I get people that call me every day and want to sell a mobile home park, and I get people that call me every day and want to buy a mobile home park. You're a real estate guy. Why don't you list and sell mobile home parks? <laughs> and this is back in the you know, early mid seventies. And my father being a hustler said, okay, I'll try this. What do I got to lose? He didn't know anything about mobile home parks, never really been to one, but, uh, started listing and selling them, got a lot of leads and started going to the shows. And again, back to hard work. He just, uh, really found a niche for himself Hmm. and that sort of took off. And in, um, in the late seventies, it was going so well, he decided to get rid of all of his other business interests and really focus on that. And he, built a building uh, that we're in now today, three-story building in Edison Park. And a funny story about that, my uh, my father, we had the drywall, he was his own general contractor, and the drywall came one day. And as opposed to getting a crane uh, to bring the drywall up to the third floor, the, one of the ca- carpenters said, hey, bud, we're going to get a crane? He goes, no, I got two cranes right there, and pointed to me and my brother, who were, I think, 10 and 12 years old, and we <laughs> carried drywall up three floors, uh, three stories for about uh, two or three days. And uh, taught me some hard work. So uh, anyhow, we're still in that building now today. Mm-hmm. And anyhow, so the, the the business took off. My father was listing and selling mobile home parks uh, throughout the early 80s. And then in uh, 1983, he had a, a mobile home park. He listed out in Elgin, Illinois, called Olux Estates. And there was a problem the day before closing, and the deal blew up. And um, the buyer walked away. And so at the time, one of my dad's friends said, well, why don't you buy this mobile home park? And my father said, I don't know how to run it. I, don't, I wouldn't know what to do. Uh-huh. He said, don't worry about it. You know a lot of people with some money. Put together some money and go ahead and uh, buy it, and uh, we'll run it together. So my father said, fine. And that was in 83. He bought his first mobile home park, which we still own today. And I was in high school. And at that point, I started working there and sweeping streets and digging water lines and repairing things, rotting sewers and planting trees. In fact, I planted a tree there back in 83 that is about, uh, what, 30, what is that, 35 years old now? Uh, and that's still there, so I had a picture there awesome. the other day with that tree. <laughs> Makes me feel old. So I started working there in the summers uh, in the mobile home park, and my father, would he bought another one, and I would, you know, again, continue to work there and th- throughout uh, – Throughout high school and throughout college, and through uh, that time, what, what did your dad teach you? You know, as far as like raising you and raising raising kids, what did he teach? Was a great thing that he taught you in that time. You know, I think one of the things that I learned the most is to learn everything, and you know, who picks up the garbage? How much do you pay? Is there a better way to do it? And you, I use the term ditch digger. Well, I, I dug a lot of ditches there, and it's not just learning hard work on how to dig a ditch. It's well, why are you digging a ditch? What kind of shovel mm-hmm. do you use? Is there a better way to dig the ditch? Who is the best ditch digger on the planet, and what can you learn from that person? Mm-hmm. So it's not just hard work on that one micro. You have to learn all the different facets of digging that ditch. And every single job, whatever it is, learning why you're doing it, how you're doing it, who's the best, and continue to learn. That's what we talk about hard work. It's mm-hmm. more learning. The hard work, sure, there's backbreaking hard work, but your mental hard work is just as important or more important, obviously, than the backbreaking hard work. So the, the you know that... that, that um the tutoring is for him was basically, you know, get your hands dirty. You're going to learn a lot of stuff, right? And and dig in, right? Don't be shy. You know, pick up a shovel, pick up a broom, uh, you know, scrub the toilets, whatever it took. Absolutely. And the other thing he taught me was to question everything. So uh, whenever he had a, a thing he didn't understand, he drove questions like crazy. So, you know, even to this day when I'm learning something, I will take somebody and I'll, I'll drill them on questions for as long as they can handle me. So I, I don't think there's any dumb question, and I'm, I was lucky enough to consider myself, quote, unquote, dumb. So when I'd ask these questions, well, that's mm-hmm. okay, I'm dumb. Yeah. And it's okay to be dumb in something you don't understand. I think a lot of people miss that, and that's just so important. And there are so many people like Gary knows that are willing to talk to somebody and mentor somebody and, hey, I was there one day, and I mm-hmm. asked all the, the dumb questions, and 
I'm willing for anybody to come and ask me as many dumb questions as they want, and I'll give them as much time as possible. Absolutely. You know, we always say, I, I always say, you know, you're, you're way better off to, to walk in any meeting as the, <clears throat> the dumbest person in the room, right? <clears throat> and ask, ask the questions you don't know, and, and uh, you're going to be the smartest in the, in the end of the, you know, end of your life, you'll be one of the smartest because you're going to learn a lot compared to those that walk in a room and think they're the smartest and don't ask a question if they don't, you know, that they don't know because they might not be looked upon as the smartest, right? And, and you're great at that, and, uh, and I strive to be the same way. It's, a, it's, a, it's more fun that way too, right? Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> Who can live up to the, you know, being the smartest anyway? And you know, those that try, gosh, I, I feel sorry for them. Um, so what, so, so ex- explain how, you, you, know, how, how you, you worked in this business for not that long of a time as a young guy, and then, and then how it transitioned to Ed, the leader of the business. Yeah, so um, I was... Well, early, early 20s, and when I graduated college and I went to work with my father right away, in a very, very short time, he, uh, his general manager left, and he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And I also got buried and had a, had a baby. So at the early 20s, I was kind of thrown into the, the real world real quick. And sort of the morbidly good news is my father having that brain tumor, as opposed to some people think is going to last forever, he knew his time on this earth was limited. Mm-hmm. So he really pushed me. And I, I willingly, I mean, he asked me and I, I really liked the business. I was lucky enough to find my passion and find what I loved and found that early in life, which some people don't get to do, but I did. And therefore he dumped a lot of uh, things on me. And uh, people say, wow, you had a lot of pressure as a young man. I said, well, I, would, I wouldn't have changed a thing because that pressure, mm-hmm. you know, turns you into a diamond. And mm-hmm. all those tough times and all that, you know, mistakes and problems and stress and that really really shaped it and once you can get through those tough times boy everything becomes easier Mm -hmm. you know as a young man people say boy i would never have my children or anybody i would say to shy away from any tough times as a young person you know get yourself in there throw yourself into it and uh try your best and learn and you're going to fail i mean it's nice to fail when you're a young man as opposed to having things be very successful your whole life and then when you're 30 or 40 years old, then having problems. Yeah. So, I mean, I look at that. People say, boy, I feel sorry for you how to do that. I said, no, I wouldn't change that for the world. Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. So you're, you're, you had uh, Patrick. How old were you had Patrick? And you were married and, and had Patrick at what, what 25. age? 25. 25. Okay. And then and at the same, similar time, right, around the same time, you're thrown into the business kind of, right? And, 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 to, and, to, and understanding how to lead the business. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, Explain that, how that worked out, what, what was going on in your head. and, and, uh, and what, what Well, it was, was a lot of mistakes. I mean, uh, just a ton of every, every, every dumb mistakes, I call it. Somebody referred to it as a dumb tax. And, uh, boy, we paid a lot of dumb tax. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of mentorship now, because, geez, if I would have had a mentorship like you, know, mm-hmm. you or anybody else, that would have just saved me so much time, energy, and effort, and, and just all the dumb stuff that we did. And, yeah. Uh, I look back and I said, boy, if I ever make it someday, I want to give back. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the old story, you can't, uh, you can't pour from an empty cup is uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't prepared. But now I feel at, at 50, early 50s that I'm willing to give back. And I have a lot of those experiences that I'm willing to pass on. One of the things that I, um, and is, I mean, I honestly would, know, would love to know is um, with all of the things that you're doing and you have a, obviously a newborn or, or at that time or even now currently, um, time management. You know, I think a lot of people are in a, in a position of business, especially when they're starting. That's mo- that's probably one of the most difficult things for them is how to not only be execute that, but then also family and, and all those other things. How did you do that during that time? Like, how were you able to manage your time and still have a successful business thrive? Well, I think it goes back to your vision and what's important to you. Um, so right now today, I have uh, my kids every Tuesday and every Wednesday, and it's on my calendar. And those are pretty much, unless something is scheduled far in advance, that is a commitment I keep. Whether it's that or it's working out or coming here to this meeting, I will be there and manage my time and put it on a calendar. And what's important, you write down and you say, this is important to me. And you focus on those things and you do not let other things creep in or meeting that may come up that would conflict. Hey, I have a commitment to these things. So I think it's important to have that vision and knowing what you want, you know, with your personal, with your family and your business. So it all starts with a vision. And then once you have the vision, you move it down to your goals. And then you break it down from goals to what you're going to do every day. And again, that sounds very simple, but that's been effective for me. And again, what's effective for me not be effective for you or anybody else. So this is just what works for me. But, you know, the, the odds of success without 
planning, as as you just said, Ed, without without that, are, are very slim, right? You're you're you you if if you have a a compass, right, from where you are today and where you want to be, and and you, and 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 you understand, you know, where the end goal is, and and the and the and you know the roadmap along the way. You might veer off a little bit, but you're going to get back on course compared to not having that, right? I mean, compared to not having any type of uh, compass and, and, and direction, um, you're going to struggle, right? And, and you, you know, we see this, I see this in my own life, I see this in anybody's life, any friends of mine, where you don't have some focus on, on, on what you want to be or where you're going, you're going, to, you're going to wander a lot and you're going to be off course a lot, right, compared to, you know, the vision you've had and the, and the, and the roadmap you've created yourself and you continue to. Um, so it, it, a, a small percentage of people in this world actually have that that roadmap right laid out, and, and not that it's a it's a rigid roadmap. It can change. It, you know, you can pivot off it, right? Um, but when you have it, right, success will come a lot easier. I, I yeah, believe. I completely agree with that. So we start off with the vision. Where do you want to be? Where do you want the company to be? Where do you want to be as a father? Where do you want to be as a person? Once you start with that vision, and that's out in front of you. Your goals may, like you say, you may change, you may adapt a little bit, but eventually you want to get to that vision. And mm-hmm. that's what's so important. A lot of people don't have that. We have that at the header of every one of our executive meetings. This is our vision. Mm-hmm. By 2025, we want to be this size company, and it's pretty granular, but it's concise. Sure. And we talk about that. And that's at the front. We, we repeat that at the beginning of every meeting, so we know where we're going. Now, again, the goals may change, and outside circumstances may change. And occasionally the vision may change, but generally it's it's been consistent vision of what we want to be. And 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 like you're saying, so so many so many people we know that are that are successful have that right. They have a vision. They they get their team members to buy into the vision, and they have a roadmap that's that's agreed upon with with their team. Um, and once in a while, like we say, they they may pivot here or there, but overall they they reach those goals. And and some of our our our, our best friends in life actually do that with their with their family as well, right? They do it great with their family, also. Now, now you're now you're hitting on both, you know, cylinders when it comes to, you know, business and family, which is even even more uncommon, right? Um, but but uh, some people we, I know do that super super well, and and some don't. But uh, so when when you, when you think about uh, that that time though, when you when you took the reins, tell us about that. When you took the reins of the business, you're in the business, you're working in it. Your 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 dad's got brain cancer. Um, you, you know, that, you know, life is short for him. Um, tell us about that and, and how that where where that went and how how you know that, that yeah those were some some really tough times and one of the first things that I did or my father and I did was look for a great support team I mean I can't stress that enough we didn't do it I didn't do it alone anybody that says they did it alone I think they're full of crap frankly mm-hmm. uh, you know you need good support you need good friends you need good uh, teammates that can tell you hey you're you're weak here you know you got to be brutally honest I, I like to say and. You're not doing this very well. We need to do this better. And listen. I mean, listening is such a huge thing. And some people have a hard time admitting they're not good at something or they're weak on something. Mm-hmm. And luckily, um, I knew that there were some things I was not good at, and I was able to hire people and help have them help us and help the company um, grow because we filled some, plugged some holes that I was not very good at. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then the transition. When your your dad your dad passes eventually. Tell us about yeah. That. So uh, along those lines, we we found a nice, uh, extremely smart uh, young lady at the time. Um, she was a single mom with three kids, and uh, she just was cut from our our same core values and our same culture. And uh, she started off as the assistant uh, sales secretary at one of our locations. And my father and I really liked her, and we sort of groomed her to become the CEO. And you guys know Dee; she's she's just a great lady, mm-hmm. and. Uh, she was very good at operations. Some of the things that I weren't good at, she was phenomenal at, and I relied a lot, and she became our COO. And I ended up sort of taking the reins on the uh, finance and the growth and the acquisitions and, and some of the accounting and the backroom and the banking uh, issues. So uh, eventually she became the CEO, and I like to say I fired myself, and I like to say that uh, I had enough uh humility to fire myself and say, you know what, I this company got too big. I cannot be the CEO anymore. And I turned the reins over her on a day-to-day basis, and I focused on some things that I was really good at. Um, you know, again, growth and acquisitions and banking and finance and those type of issues. 
And what, you know, what, what did you, back then, you know, initially, uh, what were the things that, that you had the most fun doing that, 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 but, but, and the things that you found most challenging? How did you identify what you were great at and what you, what you struggled with as a, as a mid-20s guy taking over this business? Yeah, you know, your blind spots, and I think getting around people um, that will be honest with you. And I can't stress that enough to have a, a team that is not going to tell you what you want to hear but what you need to hear is so important. And, and to listen and to have the humility to say, you know what, Ed, you're not good at that. You know, you're just not good at it, but you're really good at this. And, you know, how are we going to figure this out to make the company grow better? Mm-hmm. It's, and I, I think I was lucky enough to say this company isn't about me. It's not about me and my ego. It's about the team and growing a business. And let's do what it takes. So if your analogy is if you're if you're a great goalie, don't try to become a forward in hockey. You know, stick stick in the goal. And <laughs> you can use that analogy with, you know, any sport. But uh So so then uh when you know again picture picture this, you know, being a twenty what were you when you took it over, your dad passed away, how old are you? Well, my dad progressively got worse, so I, I, he didn't pass away till he was about. I was about thirty-five, but okay, he so was 35. getting pretty towards the end. The last few years, I was pretty much in control, and you know, so he. I would say I was about twenty-eight, twenty-nine when he kind of checked out, and I ended up buying the business from my my mother and father. Who uh, interesting story there? Um, my father, his brain tumor came back, um, and he said, "I got to sell the company." And I said, "Well, I'd like to buy it," and. Uh, they figured out a way the net profit they were making. They basically capped that net profit, and I was able to pay buy the company with no money down. So I'm very grateful for that. But then mm-hmm. my mother, being the tough old German she was, is she raised the price another ten percent on me because she didn't <laughs> want it to be too easy on me. <laughs> so and really keep me moving and hustling. God bless my mom. So so you had a deal worked out, and then mom comes along. So you know what? Uh, Your dad's making it too easy. Uh, on you. Too easy so, right now. Uh, uh, make it work a little up. harder. Yeah. Create this up to ten you know, percent higher. Yeah. And uh, did your mom do, uh, stick with the business at all at that point and help out or what other? Yeah, one? she was. You know, you talk about great support, and my mother was always the person in the background. Uh, didn't like the spotlight, but was always talking to my father and I, always poking holes in our theories and our business plan, and and was just a great sobering realist. And you need those people in your life to really push you and prod you. Why are you doing that? Why did you do this? What about this? What if this goes wrong? And continue to hammer you and and to help you. It was done out of love and to help because um, you know if the business doesn't work, you know you're you're out of you're out of business. You got nothing. So you need mm-hmm. to have that, as I call it, paranoia, pessimism. You need some healthy doses of that. And uh, she was very good at. It, and I sort of had that. And cr- frankly, have it now. I would call myself the chief, not the CEO, the chief pa- paranoid pessimistic warrior <laughs> was uh, one of my title for many, many years. And uh, it serves you well. You always, you never know. I mean, the world's a crazy place. So this, crazy this, things happen. You know, so the CPPW. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what, what, you know, back, back then, uh, you know, you, you, you're, you know, I, I know your mom uh, and, and I, she had to be an awesome mentor to have in your life. And your dad, I didn't know, but I know you get a lot of great things out of your dad. Um, what other mentorship did you receive back then? You know, what would you, would you look at back then when you think back, who are the mentors that you could call and say, man, how the heck do you do this? Uh, you know, I'm struggling with this. What do you think I should, what would you do if you were in my shoes or whatever? Right? Well, again, back then we didn't have many mentors and we made a lot, a lot, a lot of mistakes, but there was this one fellow named Hal Goldman who, uh, was just a smart guy. We would always be, again, being paranoid, wondering why he was so nice to us. And wondering why we'd ask him a question and he'd come and meet with us and sit down and talk to us and taught us things we never even fathomed existed. And again, looking back on it, I really wish I would have reached out to more mentors. And I never did that. And I really, really would encourage everybody, and I do it now, to reach out to mentors. People are willing to help. That's the other thing. I always thought that people would, why would anybody want to help some dummy like me? Why would anybody want to waste their time with me? Mm-hmm. And now as I get older and I think I feel like I have something to give back, I'm like, well, people want to help. Yeah. I mean, it's shocking that I find people want to help. I want to help people. Mm-hmm. And when you help people, you learn. And I, I love helping uh, young men and women that Quentin has us involved with. And I learn so much. I learn so much from these guys. And, uh, you know, mentorship is, 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 is a gift to me. So I love and, it. And, and what, what I find, Ed, and I'm not sure if you do the same, but mentors that I find are people that have done something, built something, and experienced some great things in life, tough times, good times, whatever. 
I find sometimes I ask in, over my years I've asked people to men, you know you didn't I didn't call it mentoring back then it was just sponging off of people right when I was asking people questions in my 20s and 30s, uh, but but you know what I, I find that the people I asked that didn't share anything with me. They didn't have a lot to share, probably. I mean, when it came to business and the things I was asking them, you know, they they had maybe they grew up with a you know in, in a very fortunate situation, had things handed to them. They just didn't have the tough times to share, or even you know the the the, the beginnings that they want that I would want them to share with, because there wasn't any, right? But those that built something from nothing, or you know, like you know, they built something and had 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 tough times, you know, like you and and and, and so many I know. They're sharing because they, they're not afraid to share because it's like, eh, yeah, I can tell you my story, man. <laughs> if you really want to hear it, you got some time, let me tell you, right? And so, so I, I, I think when you ask for mentorship to people that actually have had tough times and, and gotten through them, they're, they're, they're excited to tell them. They're not afraid of you, you know, uh, following, you know, following them, duplicating what they've done or whatever. They're pretty excited about telling you the story. Is that what you find too? Absolutely. I've mentored a couple people that started off in this business um, three, four years ago. A fellow came to me, a friend of a friend, and wanted to start buying mobile home parks. And I said, I'll help you any way I can. Mm-hmm. And people, well, aren't you afraid he's going to, you're telling him all your secrets and he's going to grow and be bigger than you. I'm like, I hope he does. I, I have, this, this is not a competition and I, I hope he does great. And, and, that, and that's great. Another young man, I just uh, started mentoring. He's going to buy his first deal. And I'm so happy for these guys. I mean, he's mm-hmm. going to buy his first deal here in January and I'm going to invest with him and uh, help him along any way I can. And anybody that doesn't do that, I kind of look down upon, like yeah. you say, Gary, if yeah. they're not willing to help somebody out that is really, really, really trying and really, really busting their butt, and, and and just looking for a little something to help them along. Jeez, what kind of person are you if you're not willing to give back? Yeah. What type of mentee do you look for? Like, if someone wants to go ahead and say, "Okay, I really want to have the opportunity to sit down with someone like uh, Gary or someone like Ed," uh, what will probably be some characteristics that you look for as far as in a mentee to go ahead and execute and, and give? Like, you know what? I do want to help you more because you appreciate my time or you appreciate, uh, you know, I guess the shared experiences that it, uh, I'm, I'm offering. Well, yeah, great question, Quentin. I think the, the thing I look for, and Gary would probably agree, is they got to want it. You just can't say, hey, sit back and teach me how to be successful. <laughs> Tell me everything you know. I want to find some young man or woman or old, doesn't matter, that is going to want to go there and say, hey, I have a list of questions. Here's what I'm struggling with. Here's my weaknesses. Here's my strengths. Mm-hmm. Here's my business plan. Could you please help me? And they take it upon themselves to uh, really push themselves. And if, if Gary and I are smart enough people to realize that if they're really out there working it and they're really pushing, you know, we've been around a long time and we could recognize if somebody's faking it or if somebody's really pushing themselves. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and you know, if, if, if you can feel there is passion about something that you've been passionate about, it's really easy, right? If you don't feel that passion, though, and they did, they just they think they, they, they want to be rich because they think you're rich, right? Eh, it's not that exciting for us, right? Mm-hmm. For me, I'm sure with you too. But, but if, you, if you know they're passionate about something you're very similar, similarly passionate about, so easy to mentor and share experiences, right? Absolutely. And so when I ask for mentoring today, I'm, I'm looking for people that, uh, that that can mentor in something that I think they might have similar passion as I do. And to, nowadays it's technology, it's, you know, it's scaling businesses nationally, globally, things like that. So it's easy for me to, to even ask for mentorship because I think they're probably passionate too. And sometimes I'm wrong. Yeah, I'll get somebody that says, yeah, I'm not. I'm not as passionate as you. I'm, I can't mentor you on that because I'm not that excited about it, buddy. You know that that's okay, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. But I think you got to know. For me, I think you got to know that the passion is 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 similar. Um, to to you know, and and you're going to see that. Right? As Ed said, you're going to see that when 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 they're asking good questions, when they're engaged, when they're when, prepared, when, they're, when they come in yeah. fully prepared to, and they've done their homework. I mean, that's one thing that people. We talk about hard work, and hard work isn't just, like I say, digging the ditch. It's understanding why, and they come in fully prepared and fully engaged and respectful of your time, and, mm-hmm. and those are all things that, again, Gary and I, for all these years, can kind of peg right away. Who's, who's a mentor in, in, in the last 10, 15 years, Ed, that you look upon and say, wow, man, I got a lot out of that person. They're, they shared so well with me, and I, I, I grew as a person because of that mentorship. What do you, think? you know, I would say as opposed to one specific person, I would say it's YPO. The YPO organization Mm -hmm. um, has just been transformative, life-changing for me. Being around a room in my forum with eight guys like Gary Rabine from all different walks of life with different businesses and different perspectives. You know, I call it the the YPO stew, that you just don't get uh, one thing from one person. You get 
uh, a bunch of different little things. Somebody a carrot, somebody some salt, somebody some pepper, somebody some broth, <laughs> and all those things are put together, and you take all those things in, and you learn from these brilliant, brilliant people, and you make it your own. And how about the fact you can spit out what you don't like, too? You know, that's they, that's a good a, point. For me, if I, come yes. across a pee, if I come across a pee in there, I'm going to spit the pee out. I'm not swallowing that pee. Absolutely. Right? But at least it's in there, and at least you can uh, get that perspective from somebody. And, you know, knowing what you don't want sometimes is important as knowing what you do want. Exactly. So that's it. Because everybody has their weaknesses, right? And, we, and, and, and as we talk, and I've learned through what, you know, we, 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 YPO comes up a lot in this because we, we do meet so many people that are leading businesses that are in YPO because they want to get better. They want they want to learn more. They want to get better. They're all a bunch of sponges, right? And, and they've all had, you know, great success, so it's easy to, to ask them to mentor you and you mentor back, right? Um, but, but again, I, I think uh, you, you think about those, that, those ones that have given you so much, right, as friends in YPO and stuff and, and otherwise. Um, is there somebody out there you want to be looked upon kind of as you see them? Like, is there, so, so I have a couple people that, that I know in my life that I'm like, man, someday if I could be looked upon as a mentor like them to somebody, right, that I actually – help them you know, get to a, 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 a point in their life they wanted to get to because of my mentorship, that's pretty cool. And if I could have many people like that uh, uh, through my life and the rest of my life, that, then, then I'm going to lead a good life. And in the end, it's uh, rewarding for me, right? Is there anybody you can picture out there yeah, that, that you said, gosh, if I could be like that guy, you know, and in and, and, and the, and the end of my life, people look at me like that guy or gal, right? Is there anybody you can think of? Well, one of the guys, one of the, some of the people I admire the most are outspoken, like, you know, people that do it their own way. And mm-hmm. I, I really, really respect that, you know, whether you're in business or, or an athlete or, or, or whatever. When you learn the basics and make it your own, that, that's really impressive to me. So I guess one of the guys in business that I really, really like is Sam Zell. Mm-hmm. Now, I may not agree with everything he does or some of his things, but the guy that is so brilliant in so many different areas and so outspoken. He's not right all the time, but uh, he wrote a great book, and uh, I just really like his contrarian view, which I, I think is very, very important. I mean, the media, if you were to sit there and listen to the media and, and to the academics, I just refuse to even listen to the media anymore or refuse to listen to academics. I like people that have been there, done that. Because mm-hmm. if you listen to them and get influenced by them, no. I mean, I'd much rather be around guys like Quentin and you and, and, and Chris and people that are out there doing it as opposed mm-hmm. to people on the TV. And I just I just think I quit I quit the media, I don't know, four or five years ago, and I've never been happier. I mean, I catch some <laughs> headlines here and there about fi- wildfires, but uh, no, that's that's a complete waste of time. Yeah. So guys that think independently and, 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 and do it their own way, I really, really respect. So there's a number of guys like that yeah. out there, but Sam Zell, because he's in Chicago, kind of jumps yeah, to my yeah. head. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and and I guarantee you, you'll be a guy that's looked upon. My, I mean, and I, you know, we've met Sam. I met Sam Zell through through different uh, YPO and other stuff, and really, really neat guy. I mean, definitely, you know, beats at his own drum and uh, doesn't really doesn't really care. I mean, but yet compassionate guy, you know. So yeah, you got to like him. Uh, and and uh, again, there's no doubt in my mind you're you're going to be looked upon like that, and and uh, in a in a to, to many many people. It's uh, I have a far, long long way to go to be anywhere in his uh, <laughs> in his stadium in his ballpark. I would He's, disagree. Yeah. I disagree. But okay, so t- uh, tell us about you know what what you looked upon and and uh, what you've done and what you're going to do in the future when it, when it looks at when you look at differentiation in your business. What sets you apart? What's allowed Zeman Homes to grow like it has? Um, your name in the industry in mobile home parks is is very strong as a, as a you know very high quality. Um, yeah, what, what's what's created that your image your 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 culture? Um, what's what type, you know talk about that kind of stuff differentiation in your market? What's what's grown your business like it has? Yeah, I think some of this sounds <laughs> cliche, but we use the term brilliant at the basics, um, and I can't stress that enough. I mean, it's the basic blocking and tackling. Are you answering the phone? Are you being good to your customers? Is the place look clean? Uh, are you hiring the right people? Are they saying the right thing to customers? So the simple basic blocking and tackling that a lot of people don't have the patience or the energy or the focus to really focus on those small things. You take care of those small things and you treat your customers right and you treat your people right. The big things make it a lot easier. They're not still difficult, but uh, that's a huge, huge issue. I mean, core values to us, we learned, again, through the dumb tax and many mistakes, that core values for our business is just such a huge, huge, huge issue. I can't stress enough. Knowing who you are as a company and as people 
and knowing what your core values are. For example, ours are honesty, respect, uh, cooperation, uh, the ability to, and desire to give wow to our customers and mm-hmm. teammates, and fun. And we know that anybody we hire, we interview on core values. And once we have core value alignment amongst our team, things become easier. And again, we've made some mistakes in the past. We may have hired some really, 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 really good people, really smart, but they weren't honest. Mm -hmm. And it just becomes a nightmare. Because if you're honest and the guy sitting next to you isn't honest and our core values don't align, it doesn't work. And you can try to make it work, but if somebody's inherently not honest or sees things differently and is willing to cut the corners and and quote unquote screw people, they just don't work out. Mm -hmm. If somebody's not respectful, we've had that issue in our business about not being respectful to customers because they Mm -hmm. may live in a mobile home. And that's just unacceptable to us. You must be respectful to everybody. It doesn't mean you can't be fair and tough and firm, Mm -hmm. but you have to be respectful. So core values to me, I think it goes back to the vision. If you, you have to have that vision and then you have to have your core values and know who you are and what people you have on your bus, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And those people must, absolutely must, all the way down from the from the guy that picks up the trash to a senior VP must have those core values aligned, in my opinion. Absolutely. absolutely. I agree 100%. Uh, think, think about uh, some, some of your toughest times over this, the last 20 years. What are some times that, you know, you, you, you got kicked in the teeth that you, you got back up and, you know, put your teeth back in and, and uh, <laughs> went after it again? Okay. But, Oh my goodness! I can't more more times than I can remember all those mistakes and like I keep saying the dumb tax we've paid from all the dumb stuff I've done, and it's a matter of just getting back up and and grinding it out. You know, I, I again I was I was lucky enough not to be that great of a student. I mean, people say that I, I feel lucky. I was mm-hmm. lucky enough not to be that great of an athlete. And you know, I use the analogy of hockey. We used to go out and shovel off the ponds uh, down the street uh, in Park Ridge, and we play hockey all day. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't that good. But darn it, if I didn't go and do all the dirty, nasty stuff, standing in front of the net and, and digging in the corners, and as I got out of, and I started playing hockey for a men's team, I would do all those dirty, <laughs> nasty stuff. And I wasn't that great of a technical skater, but people liked me on the team because I was willing to go in there and stand in front of the net and get my cross-checked and go in the corners and get punched and slugged, and that's what it takes. It's that grit and it's that hard work and, and willing to be get dirty and not being afraid to do that mm-hmm. every single day. And and you think that's uh, you know part of leadership pretty much? I mean, uh, you get in the weeds, getting dirty, doing the tough stuff. I mean, uh, you feel like that's that's been part of your leadership, and and, and you feel that's a big thing that pays off when you when, yeah. when you look in, at leadership. In, in my experience, this is just my experience that you know guys that have been there done that. You know, Gary's been out there paving driveways. I've been out there literally digging ditches and fixing water lines at mobile home parks. When I go into a room with my team. Well, Ed did that. You know, Gary used to go on a truck and pave driveways. I mean, to me, and I know to Gary and I, we're very aligned with it. There are some guys that, you know, got straight A's at Wharton School of Business that can do it a little differently than Gary or I, but that's not me. That's that's their thing. But I think most of us entrepreneurs are scrappy uh, people that just go out there every day, and I don't know what it is, but we just get up every day and we keep at it. And mm-hmm. I think the never-quit attitude and keep going at it and at it and at it and never stopping. It's it's difficult to pe- beat a person that never quits. And mm-hmm. that's just so true, and that just <laughs> right. kind of rings in my head, is never, ever, ever quit. Yeah, yeah. Is, is there, is there any, can you think of anything in your industry that's changed your industry or anything that you guys have been a part of that's been disruptive in your industry? Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it seems like a pretty consistent industry. It seems like if you take care of the customers, live by your core values, that, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to do good things, right? But is there anything disruptive? In, you know, my, I have a boring industry in, in paving, right? Concrete and asphalt and all the things I do are dirty, boring industries to many people, not to me. But, but, but we continually try to figure out how can we be disruptive, right? How do we change the industry? Anything on your side that you guys have done or tried to do? Yeah. Uh, somebody told me if you're not reinventing yourself or really changing and adapting every five years, you're going to die. So I, I look back and I say it back in 1983, if we were to do things the same exact way, we'd be bankrupt. And uh, so there's been a number of external changes, you know, various changes of laws and, and, and market changes of people's tastes and those kind of things that we've had to adapt to, to make our customers uh, happier. And uh, again, to abide by the regulation and rules and laws. So we constantly continue to look at those things. However, we're not willy-nilly changing every five minutes of the latest trend. Mm-hmm. We like to say we crawl, walk, and run. 
So when things come up new, we may try a pilot program at a property and see how it goes, figure it out, make all of our mistakes on a micro level, then roll it out. Then we may walk a little bit until we're fully ready to run. So there are in business, you need to adapt. You need to change the markets and, and circumstances and things. And we continue to do that and continue to stay on it. Another thing we do, we're famous for, and I'm unashamed to say, I steal ideas. Mm. I'm the biggest thief on the planet when it comes to, I see somebody that does somebody better to me than me or our company. I say, guys, what about this guy? They're doing it way better than us. Our idea is dumb. Let's go take a look at what they're doing. Implement the crawl, walk, run process and see if we can do it. Sure. And, and, and can, you, uh, can you think of something that, uh, that, 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 was, that you, know, you, you learned from somebody else, like you're saying, and you just you, you jumped in and worked out, or in some cases where it didn't work out? Can you see any examples of something you learned spon- sponging off anybody like that? Um, um, sure, there's some things with technology and websites. If I see somebody with a great website uh-huh. or, or whatever it is, I'll, I'll say, hey, you know what? I really like this, guys. What do you think about this? I mean, it goes down from signage to, to employees or to whatever it is, policies, I'll steal an, I'm unashamed. I'll steal an idea from anywhere I can, from anybody I can. I don't care who it is. <laughs> and I really don't think, stealing may be a harsh word, but I don't well, think people care a, that I, I borrow their best practices. Well, How it's about called that? duplication. Yes. Well, here, here's the here's, here's deal. And, and, and if you were a guy that didn't allow, that didn't share otherwise, it'd be different, you know, but because you're like, hey, use whatever you want. Here's who I am. Here's what we do, right? And I, I know that that's who you are, right? If competition comes in and says, "Hey, how you do?" You're going to share with them anyway. You know, hey, try this, man. This is what I, this is what I found is uh, that works for me, right? Yeah, I have some colleagues in the mobile home park business. We get together. We used to a couple times a year and share best practices. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, you guys are doing it way better than me. I'm stealing your idea. Oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. That's fine. Perfect. Great. Do you think it's because of execution? Like, oh, you can have it, but can you do it as good as I'm doing it? Do you? Quentin, that's a great point. I always say, you know, a high, a high school football team can steal the Chicago Bears defensive playbook, but <laughs> that doesn't mean they're going to be the Chicago Bears. I mean, that that uh, so you have to execute. And execution is extremely difficult, and it takes a lot of time, energy, effort, and, and frankly, rolling up the sleeves hard work to execute. You know what? Hey, we got to go back on this because I, I don't want to forget about this, and I forget easy, right? You know that. All right, I was at the Bears. I was at the Bears game last night, and uh, and and I go to Bears games once in a while. With Ed, Ed and I go back and forth with tickets and stuff like that. But you got to tell the story of your grandpa and uh, the founding of the Bears, because that's an amazing story. So you can give us the just a five minute uh, story of how that worked out, because I mean, cool story. Yeah. So my grandfather, my mother's father, uh, Edward Carl, that's who I'm named after, Dutch Sternemann. Uh, grew up in Springfield, Illinois, and uh, back in those days, uh, he started playing high school football and was very, very good at it and uh, went to U of I playing football and met a guy named George Hallis. And to make a very long story short, uh, back in those days, professional football was much like professional wrestling now. It was just a nasty, dirty, you know, uh, probably fixed you know, games. And uh, so my grandfather and George Hallis, they uh, formed a team and uh, called the uh, Decatur Staley's. Uh, Mr. Staley hired them to get the group together. They played the Arcola. There's a whole long story with that I can I can talk about, but uh, they started the very first paid professional game. Uh, and uh, is it, like, is it like 1919 or was it's, it? I believe I had the 1919 somewhere around yeah, there. Yeah, because I've heard the story from the Hallis, the Hallis, or you know, from the McCaskey family. But get yeah, going. So anyhow, uh, they moved the team eventually to Chicago. And my father, my grandfather, was a uh, the halfback. He was a player coach along with Hallis, <laughs> and uh, th- my father ended up. Uh, they ended up signing Red Grange to the very first contract. Gave him a, there's a whole crazy wonderful story about that. And roughly, they won the championship in, uh, boy, 1929. Roughly 1933, I believe it was, my grandmother didn't like the football business because it was just so rough and tumbled, and it was just a (laughs) wild, wild west back then. And uh, they had four kids, and my grandmother said, hey, you know what, Dutch, you got to get out of this thing, so you should uh, tell Hallis you want to sell your 50% share. So... um, (laughs) Story oh, can goes. I, can you tell me, was this after they bought Staley out or no? Was Staley, well, was, it was there. Staley, St- Staley just started to paid uh, my grandfather and Hallis to have a bunch of guys from U of I and yep. uh, to the 
to play the to, to Arcola. I forget what they're called, Arcola something or other. And that was the very first professional game. But then they moved the team. Staley just put them together. But then mm-hmm. my grandfather and Hallis moved to Chicago, and there was the original teams. But Staley, Staley got bought out at one point, too, I know. Um, I, uh, I forget how the story went, but okay. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that so was. So anyway, 33 or so? Yeah, so 33, my, my grandmother uh, said, you know, Dutch, you got to get out of this football thing. So my grandfather went to Hallis and says, hey, we, w- let's move this partnership along. I'll buy you out or you buy me out. The long story short, I believe the number was uh, – Fifty thousand dollars that my uh, back in those days, nineteen thirty something, nineteen thirty two was a lot of money. Sure. So Hallis had to pay my my grandfather fifty thousand dollars for half the share of the Bears, <laughs> and uh, you know they remained friends. And my my grandfather would still help coach, and he would see kids playing on the side of the road playing football. He'd go and just go, hey, you got to block this way and do this kind of stuff. So he remained a football fan his whole life. So so as, as we both know, that's pretty modest, but you know. Th- this is the start of the NFL. It yeah. seemed like you just started a team. This is the beginning of the NFL, the founders of the NFL, with a, a few, some other U of I guys, I think, at, at the time. Uh, the guy that started the Cleveland Browns, and that's why their colors, uh, or, you know, a couple other teams. Cleveland Browns, who else was there back then? Do you remember? Packers were there. Packers. Um, um, Giants, maybe? I think it was the Giants, yeah. Um, There's a few just, teams that aren't there anymore. Just a ha- yeah, 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 but a, just a handful of teams initially, right? Yes, and my grandfather is the only founder, player, coach of an NFL franchise that is not in the Hall of Fame. Wow. So, uh, a lot of people don't know it. He was very humble and quiet, and Hals is more of the, of the, of the spokesperson. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's why they kind of, you know. So it would be like you and I. I Me, mean, the, 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 the big <laughs> mouth, right? And you, the humble guy. Right? I might get more attention than you. Yeah. See it? You, gotta, you just got to get out there, Ed, and you know, brag about yourself a little more. Ed, that's an amazing story. Isn't that, awesome? Isn't that, that is awesome? That to, is to, awesome. To sit with Ed in a game like, and, and, and you know, like, hear oh, the yeah. stories of this is incredible. And oh, you, yeah. you've guys got a bunch of your, – your mom still has some of the cool stories, right, articles and things like that, right? Yeah, and I got a lot of the old pictures, the original pictures of my grandfather. Oh, and awesome. There's some really cool stuff. Someday in fact, they gave my, my aunt and my mom gave a bunch of stuff to the Hall of Fame they're working on now, cleaning it all up, and uh-huh. like the original contract with uh, Red Grange. There's a picture of my my father and Hallis, my grandfather and Hallis uh, signing Red Grange and all those crazy <laughs> stories about the barnstorming trip. I don't know if you heard about that, but that's uh-huh. interesting to read sometime about how they took him around because he, uh, Red Grange at the time, was a huge, huge, huge college you know star, star. star yeah, and to, yeah. for him to sign in the NFL was like you know signing to professional wrestling. So mm-hmm. that whole start was the start of the NFL where it became legitimatized the whole NFL uh-huh. because Red Grange signed with the Chicago Bears. What year was that? You know about. I don't remember, twenty five maybe. Okay, some somewhere in there. Oh, that's awesome. Well, you know, you 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 have up here, and one of my notes it says, you know, you know, ask questions. So, you know, anytime you want to invite me over, I will. You know, if if I can have the opportunity to come over there, I'd love to be over there and, and get these stories, sit down at your at your feet, and just eat some popcorn and be like, all right. So, tell me about the growth of how this happened. That is awesome. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it would be fun is if you could if you took pictures. I know the stuff is going to the Hall of Fame and all that, but if you could take pictures of the stuff you're sending and 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 have the stuff that you do have, right? And do like a really how about what what a cool thing that would be, right? For a bunch of young people, you know, a bunch of you know anybody, a bunch of friends and entrepreneurs, whoever, whoever you want to. You know, the true mentors. Would yeah, be we can have some for, bears come through men- too. Oh my, for a true mentors <laughs> event. You know, Quentin gets Soldier Field every year for a half a day, right? And 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 has an event there. Boy, this would be amazing. Man, you see how we all we come together, right, right, right? This is awesome. We're 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 gonna leverage him. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. Should, somebody should, should do that, and I get a little frustrated because my aunt sometimes doesn't. I want to get the stuff written and get it. Somebody should write a book about it, but yeah. it's just. I want somebody to go interview my aunt because she was there when all this stuff happened and she knows all the stories and she has all the, you know, all the play cards, my grandfather's notes and all that stuff. My grandfather, when he was older, would diagnose. Di- uh, Sounds like a job for Chris. Yeah. I was about to say. <laughs> I, would, I would love you to do it, Chris, but I don't know if she'll. We've been bugging her and now she's 89 old, old and her health is failing. And, well, <laughs> <laughs> now's the time to get it done. I. I've been talking about it for years, but okay. Sorry, I went off on a tangent. So no, we we got you off on a tangent okay. that we loved, right? <laughs> uh, what, what a great tangent! tangent. That was can't good. be a better one than that. That was good, right? <laughs> that was so good. I, and it's like I, you've you've said before, like oh yeah, and I'm like okay, well, I, I, all right, that makes sense. You know, you so told Ed me about being this too history. modest, you didn't even know, right? You no, I mean, and you the one that brought it up all the time. I'm like okay, well, and then you brought it, in, and you just told me the details. You are the great grandson of a person. No, no, no. Grandson. Grandson. grandson, I'm grandson. sorry, you are the grandson 
of a guy who started the NFL. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Crazy, right? Um, so let's get back to the, the rest, <laughs> the boring stuff now. That's that's just exciting as heck, right? Let's get back to the boring stuff now. The you know, you know, business and entrepreneurship and free enterprise. Um, uh, you know, t- tell us about uh, you know this, this road you've taken, Ed, and the success you've had. You're again, we got to dig this stuff out of you because you're too dug on modest. But you know, when we think about the success you had and your businesses had, and your family in the, in in, the, in this in, the, in America, you know, can you can you see this happen anywhere else? I, I like to ask this question to my my friends, right? If you're if you're in any other country in the world, could this success have happened like it has here? Yeah, I'm not much of a world traveler, but I had the luck to go to Cuba in 2016. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, I went there and boy, you I mean, you look at this stuff and you see it on, on TV or in documentaries about, you know, communism and socialism, but to actually see it and experience these poor people in Cuba that have so- socialism. Mm-hmm. And it is the most depressing, awful place. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful country. The people are wonderful, but socialism is just the most toxic, horrible form of government there possibly is. I mean, these people are just desperate for mm-hmm. capitalism. And I, seeing it firsthand, knowing the government owns everything, the government controls these people, the government who is corrupt and horribly inefficient, and it's just it's just a really, really sad situation. I guess I never realized it, because I don't travel much, how mm-hmm. lucky we are in this country. Yeah. You know, despite capitalism's problems and some of the failures that capitalism is going to, just by its very nature, you know, the people are going to fail in capitalism. The old saying is uh, uh, capitalism without failure is like religion without hell. I mean, there is, you must fail. There, mm-hmm. it, absolutely, because the success rises to the top, and, and that's just going to happen, and there's going to be mistakes, and it's not a perfect system, but it is the only system. Uh, communism and socialism are just purely evil, and it's just a really, really sad situation. The fact that people want this in this country is just mind-boggling. If they were ever to spend some time in a socialist country, they would learn real quick yeah. How lucky we have it here. So, so raising your kids, you know, Patrick, boy, he, Patrick's a chip off the old block. He, want, he wants to do the tough stuff. He wants to work, you know, uh, dig the ditches, right, your, your mobile home parks and all this. I mean, what an amazing kid he is. Um, and you're two young boys, and you got, now you've got a baby girl now, right? What do you, how, do you, how do you talk to them about this stuff? How do you teach them? How do you, how do you, how do you explain this to them, and then how do you say, uh, explain this to, to, to young people you're mentoring or anybody you're mentoring? Well, I think on the work side, you know, I've always stressed to my son Patrick that, you know, hard work is key. Hard work mm-hmm. will take you a long way and, and knowing why you're working hard and, and hard work, I just can't stress enough, not the physical hard work, but the mental hard work. Mm-hmm. And I'm also famous for giving the advice, don't do dumb stuff. You don't have to be the smartest guy in the room, but as long as you're not doing really dumb stuff, stay away from bad people, stay away from bad places and stay away from bad things. If mm-hmm. you can just take care of that downside it becomes a little easier to, to live your life not doing the dumb stuff and the bad stuff. So I, I being taught uh, to work at a very, very young age, I instilled that work ethic on Patrick. Um, you know, my mom lives on a farm now, and uh, when, as a young child, I would make Patrick you know, pick up sticks, and, and it wasn't picking up sticks. It was running to pick up the sticks mm-hmm. and really pushing that you must get this done, you must be efficient, and, and really – getting on him and uh our other fun was we would split logs Mm -hmm. and uh we'd split logs for hours and hours at a time and split them and stack them and they had to be split and teaching him those basic hard work duties and 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 how the engine works and again on this log splitter and how to stack it the right way and and really having him understand why he's working and what he's doing it sounds kind of simple and silly but once you can understand those things it makes things a lot easier um and my my 13 year old and 10 year old um we don't have a cleaning lady, so uh, I make we all clean the clean the place, and uh, I tease them that uh, the bathroom better be so clean, that toilet better be so clean that the Queen of England would be proud to take a dump on this toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and they look at me kind of silly, like, "Why would the Queen of England want to take a dump on this toilet?" <laughs> I tell them that's not the point. You better do the job right and make it so she would want to. So again, it's teaching them those basic, simple things, and you can handle those basic, simple things. The rest of the you're you're way way ahead of a lot of people that aren't willing to do those basic, simple, hard work things. So so they're now thirteen and eleven. Is that right? Your boy, your younger boys. Thirteen and ten. Thirteen and ten. Mm-hmm. So pretty soon you're gonna you're gonna get them doing some serious work, huh? 
That's correct. Digging ditches yes. himself and all that. Yes, and I had them listen to your po- the podcast before, and uh, my 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 ten year old listened to the Jimmy John one. We all did, and uh, Wait, he didn't listen to mine first. He, well, they listened to yours. Oh. They didn't want to lay asphalt. They want uh, the ten year old wants to work at Jimmy John's. Is that right? Yes, that's uh, correct. Son of a gun. So, uh, <laughs> Sam, subs over over <laughs> asphalt and concrete. Yes. I, I'm gonna have, you, let make sure make sure I have a talk with that young man. Yeah, we'll have you do that. All right, and then okay, now you get three boys. It's you know, it's kind of t- easy to be you know gritty with the boys, you know. Now you got a little baby girl, man. Congratulations on yes, that. Yes, thank you. Thank now you. with this little baby girl, what do you you know what do you do there? Do you, does does she also work as hard? Do you get you know when when she gets to be ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen years old? Do you you know? I think so. Maybe a different kind of work, <laughs> but you know, with that work also comes respect. And again, it goes back to our core values about being respectful. So I think when you can learn that you're, you're scrubbing a toilet or splitting a log or whatever it may be, loading the dishwasher, that you're respectful of other people knowing that that's their job. Mm-hmm. And there's no shame in being a janitor. There's no shame in, in, in being a waitress. There's no shame in any of that. And so to me, the hard work is a sign of respect of other people, knowing that, that these people do that every day and they're out there earning a living for their family and that's just a respectful thing for me. Yeah, and then the exer- the exercise of work, right? The dignity of work and the exercise of work. It's it's like it's like exercising your brain as you read more and study more. I mean, if if you don't do that, you lose it, in my yeah. opinion, right? Absolutely. And the other interesting thing, my my ten year old, because I make him cut grass now, is we got done cutting a, the field at my mom's farm, and uh, he got done. He goes, you know, that was really satisfying. Mm. <laughs> and it goes back. To, I'm I'm a big collector of quotes, and I, I've been collecting them since I've been a young man. And one of the things that jumped out at me is that laziness may appear attractive, but work gives satisfaction. And it kind of just hit me, oh, wow, that's, like that's true. That, that uh, It's very satisfying to get that grass cut and get that final thing done and go, wow, we just cut that, and it looks really, really It sounds silly, but uh, that's important for, yeah, for that's a kid really to see good. that. As opposed to playing Fortnite all day. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. All right, so so you know, in business, you know, we we you've, you've gone you've come a long way. Um, Zeman Homes is 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 a uh, you know leading organization in the country when it comes to the you know the mobile home parks. The market is like on fire, as expensive as heck. I know you're you're a guy that was acquiring and had, had vision of acquiring, and you've done that along along the way here. But are you doing that now? And what are your thoughts now? The future of your industry, or is there a pivot you make now if if it's not the place to buy? Yeah. Again, we question everything and look at everything. And uh, while the market, the real estate market in general and commercial is very, very hot, Mm -hmm. and we're not so sure it's the time to be buying. So we look at, well, what can we do? And, um, you know, we're, again, crawl, walk, run. Uh, We're building a couple of projects. That's not really our expertise, but uh, we've done some expansions, some construction and development. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the things that we're looking, we're crawling into right now. And hopefully we'll be walking here in a maybe a year or two or three, and who knows, maybe we may run. But that's what the market has given us. That's what we need to adapt to. And, again, if we were to continue to do things like we did five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we wouldn't be very successful. So we have to continue to innovate and continue to look at new ways to do things and continue to grow. In the in the, uh, in the trailer park industry, is there is there any leaders there that you? I mean, you have to mention them, but are there leaders there that you follow that you you'd like to you'd like to emulate or you know? Yeah, I would say that there are uh, <laughs> friendly competitors. We're a pretty friendly industry. That some guys do certain things really, really, really well that I like to steal their ideas, and some guys don't do so well, and I don't do what they do. But I wouldn't say there's one. I mean, there's a couple really good, really, really good businesses that do a great job, and. Uh, friends with them and really respect them. There's, there, I mean, <clears throat> other developers out there, I mean, that do other developing, do you get inspired by them as well? I mean, you're in the trailer park world, right? But, and, and uh, um, you don't sell, you don't call it the trailer park. What do you call Manufactured it? Manufactured housing. Manufactured Harry. housing. Come on. How <laughs> many years have I known you? And you still call them trailer parks? <laughs> okay. Manufactured housing. <laughs> but, but with this manufactured housing business, you, you, there's other developers too that do other types of developments. Is, is there some similarities that you can take from them and, uh, yeah, there are. I mean, obviously, there's some nice subdivisions, some apartment complexes and things we can steal ideas from and, and use be- best practices. And, you know, the, the market tastes change, as you know, throughout mm-hmm. every every few years. And we like to stay ahead of that. And we're working on that right now. I, I, I mean, I, I, I remember, uh, gosh, I don't know, was this 12, 14, 15 years ago, you and I first met. And then, you know, it was like the second time I met him. I'm like, this dude reminds me of somebody, you know. No. 
<laughs> he's a good looking dude. I mean, he's, he's got all his hair. I was going bald, at, you know, getting thin at the time, right? And uh, and he's he's got the, all his hair, man. It's going all different directions. And good looking guy in great shape, right? He remind me of a young Trump, right? Just remind me of a young Trump, you know, like like a Don Jr. looks today, kind of, right? And and I said, uh, man, you're a developer, builder. I said, you know, you, you look kind of like a Trump. I, my nickname for you is Trailer Trump from now on. <laughs> And this is a while ago. This is a long time ago. Yeah, it was like 15 years ago. Ed, he started Ed, calling me Trailer Trump and, before he be. And Ed, Ed rolled his eyes. You know, whatever, right? Just kind of this roll. He didn't think it was going to stick. He didn't think I'd continue to call him that. And he didn't. And he probably didn't think we'd ever become very good friends. He, he thought, this guy's a, a dip. There's no way we'll be. We we'll become good friends. And, and Trailer Trump is still is nicknamed him from me. Did anybody else call you Trailer Trump? Nope, no. Gary, you're the only <laughs> one. <laughs> Thankfully, thank you. I got. I haven't spread it. I haven't spread it strong enough. Yeah. But, you know, now a few more people are going to hear oh, this. Great. So. <laughs> But uh, but no, you know he, he's uh, uh, he, he thinks outside the box. He's a leader, and I, mean, I think it's not a bad. You know, I think the Trump guy's done okay in the real estate world too. So it's not a bad thing to, to be looked upon. Um, looks wise today, maybe I think uh, you know maybe you know Don Jr. more or less because you're you're kind of closer to his age, I think. Um, what what uh, you know what's what's going to drive you you know the next. Next fifteen twenty years, Eddie, you're, you're, I don't think you're the guy that's gonna gonna roll up and retire and uh, and, and sit home all day and uh, watch soap operas. What uh, what do you see yourself over fifteen twenty years now? Um, now that you've you've gotten a place where you've got a great CEO and and, and you know had a great CEO, you know, uh, you know she retired and uh, now you've got another great CEO, uh, somebody you brought in that's that's doing a bang up job. Um, so you're you're in good shape there. It sounds like. Uh, what what do you want to, you know, what do you want to do the next fifteen twenty years? Well, I think uh, growth. You know, the old saying, growth contains the germ of happiness. So uh, we want to continue to grow. I mean, mm-hmm. our our team is all about growth and smart growth and and doing things the right way. And as I mentioned, brilliant at the basics. So we want to definitely continue to grow the business and have a lot of fun. Um, from a personal level, I, I, I've been giving back, you know, true mentors. I, I like that. I like Turning Point USA. I've been involved in, in some other uh, philanthropic organizations. But uh, I like to keep busy. I can't slow down. I feel like I still have a lot of gas in the tank. I'm relatively young. And I want to keep growing and keep learning. I mean, I get really, really juiced up by learning new things and being around smart people. I find that very energy energizing. And uh, who knows where the future will take us, but I'm, I'm sure we're going to stay in the real estate business. We don't like to venture too far outside of our core competencies, and I think that's another key thing we've done. We've really stuck for us. Again, this just works for us. Other people can do a lot of different things. Again, I mentioned Sam Zell is so brilliant in so many ways. I'm not that smart. I have to stick with what I know and, and implement the crawl, walk, run thing when I need to uh, do something new or we need to change our company. So I want to continue basically in the real estate business and continue to grow this company. So, um, and, I'll, and I'll disagree with you on the smart thing. I think you're smarter than Sam Zell. I've listened <laughs> to Sam. I, I know a little bit about I think you're smarter, uh, but, but you know, that, that's, that's you, and you're never going to think that. That's just good. Um, where, where do you, uh, when, when you, when you look at, again, your legacy, the legacy you're going to leave behind, this, this, this great business that's going to continue to grow, and, and, you know, let's go 20 years forward, and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're pushing 80, um, uh, you know, what do you, what do you want to look back and say, you know, these are the things that I'm known for and I'm, 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 I'm happy that I'm known for these things besides raising great people, which I know you're doing in your, in your, in your three sons and your, in your little baby daughter, you know, what, what else? Or maybe you can even talk about that if you want to. Boy, that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I don't think too much about it. I, I, I think in terms of sticking to my core values and if you're an honest guy, you're a humble guy, you're a hard worker, you're respectful, you know, you're kind your legacy sort of takes care of itself. So I, I don't think too mm-hmm. much about what people are going to say about me. Um, and I frankly probably pretty much don't care. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I know there's some things that people may not like about me, and like I can accept that, and I'm not the, a traditional guy by any means. So, you know, I may rub some people the wrong way, which is completely fine and doesn't bother me. But I guess uh, I'm not one to judge what my legacy is, and it may mean something different to everybody. So I I, I don't think too much about it, honestly. Hmm. So Awesome. Well, I don't think you have to because I, I know your blunt honesty, your leadership, and, and your mentorship. Um, I know what it's going to look like, and I can tell you about it, but I'm, I'm not going to tell you because you're, you know, you're, we're going to find out that it, 
I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you the secret of what, what his legacy is going to look like. And when we're 90 years old, Ed and I are going to be 90 years old. You're going to be still a punk at, uh, what, 60? <laughs> I don't know if you're going to be, punk right? at 60. You know, 60 years old. Yeah, around and that time. We're going to be rocking in a chair. You'll be rocking us probably, both of us, right? <laughs> we'll be drooling a little bit. You'll be wiping that up for us. But bottom line is we're going to be talking about, you know, the, you're going to be telling us the legacy we created. And I'm going to say, I, I knew Ed's legacy. Was Remember I told you that? We're going to write it down, too. Okay, we've got to write it down. But it's going to be one that uh, so many people are going to look at as, as, as uh, with inspiration. Oh, it's a day, you know? November 19th. Yeah. <laughs> right? 20, so, so many are going to be inspired by, by you, Ed, and, and uh, I can't wait to see it. So uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing it. I shouldn't say I can't wait. I see it every day. So, so true. So thanks for that. Um, Q, what else you got, buddy? Man, I got a lot of... Uh True takeaways, um, you know, for sure. And uh, I mean, like a couple pages of notes, just a couple. One, hard work is the real key to success. And honestly, uh, with being part of, you know, you leading the forum that I was involved in, as well as with Gary, I see it every day. Um, something that was really insightful, learn everything, question everything. And I think that's huge because a lot of people, they just take what you say. And they OK, well, why is it this way? The, the word why is extremely important. And um, I love this. It's OK to be dumb in things you don't understand. That's huge. Is everybody feels like they have to just know everything and, and ask you. Pressure always turns you into a diamond, and that's a good way mm -hmm. of looking at life, right? Um, you know, when challenges arrive, look for a good support system. Have a team uh, with you who, who, who is not just telling you what you need to hear, but really what you want to hear. And, and, um, and I can see that even some of the times and you're helping us with the true board and you're telling us, okay, mm -hmm. look, you know, from that perspective. So mentorship is huge and I appreciate you so much because he shows that all the time when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, this is something I've never heard before. The crawl, walk, run philosophy when it comes to business. Everybody wants to dream big and start big, but they should dream big and start small and just do it quickly, right? And that's kind of what you're saying. But I think one of the biggest things, and I see it as a testament to you and Gary, um, it's difficult to be the person that never quits. And, um, and, and, that's, and that's huge. It's from your, from your grandfather to your dad to even you. It's, it's good to see that. And, and um, the Zeman Homes is the, mo is the largest and it's the most respected in uh, mobile manufacturing um out there today and um, i can see why you know so it's uh it's pretty awesome man but those are my true takeaways man those are pretty cool you got some good ones there man there's some you as some we call them nuggets these are some nuggets yeah you know i want you we said golden nuggets Go a couple times but I, I, I thought you know it's gotta be gold nuggets or, okay. nu or nuggets okay because right. golden give me painted gold right golden <laughs> right but gold is actually gold and gold it, nuggets but a couple times i said golden nuggets like hey, that didn't sound right it's <laughs> just mcdonald's but, the, but these are definitely gold, gold nuggets, nuggets right here man and uh and and that uh you're going to continue to inspire me at q and anybody you meet and and uh uh, I'm, I'm blessed to be, have you as my friend, so I really appreciate you being on the on our on our podcast today. Um, thanks for being here, brother. Any 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 last words for you, buddy? No, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Great fun to be around you guys. Give me some, brother. All right, and we'll see you all next time on Ditch Digger CEO. See ya. <laughs>